good day to you. This is Dr. Dennis L. Ward, Sr. This is the Restore Executive Life Leadership Coaching and Consulting I Will Restore Podcast. We're coming to you. You may notice that there's a difference between my speaking in one way and then my speaking in another. That may have to do with the fact that at one point I'm talking via my Yeti mic and then at another point I'm speaking via my I've studied and used the eight A's. I called them, when I did the industrial organizational psychology, I called them eight A's of transformation and the whole process of working with those. So they have for me, they have for me both a spiritual component and then they also have the industrial organizational, what we would call a scientific component as well. And so they are a theoretical process by which I believe applies in all fields. And the eight A's, the first A we have dealt with, and we've called the A of acceptance, or excuse me, the A of awareness. And we have the theme that goes along with that, the theme music, is awareness of vision, awareness of vision. And we've tied that to transformative learning theory, and then also the hero's journey. Awareness of vision, when it comes to the hero's journey, we've tied that to the aspect of the call to adventure. The call to adventure deals with the aspect that a person is in their ordinary world, as it's called, and then they have a vision. They have a call to adventure. It is a call. That is compared to an individual getting a vision. It could be of a business when it comes to the aspect of industrial organizational psychology. It could be they are going to start a new business. It could be they are going to actually move their vision to a new vision for how their business that they've already been a part of is going to function in a new way uh, because of various things. It could be the regulations that they are working on. That's been a new demand that is placed upon them. They could set a higher level of productivity or proficiency. That could be a new vision. All kinds of things can promote. Competition can promote a new vision. So there could be a number of things that are involved in regard to what they're doing in regard to vision. And also perturbation. Perturbation has to do with a set of things that you did not invite necessarily, but it comes about that perturbation takes place. You can look up that particular word. Uh, Abuse could be perturbation for an individual. Uh, I studied the aspect that there are trees, I believe, in the northern areas of the United States of America where there are pine trees and there would be a whole forest that would be burned down. And of late, we've heard about these things where there have been the fires in California and things like that in the past few years. Well, there's a particular northern pine, as I've understood it, that the whole forest would burn down. But in that forest, the pine trees would have a type of resin that would be in the cones, and the cones would not open until there was a particular level of heat that would be involved with those pine cones. And that resin would not come out until, uh, not dry up, until there was a particular level of heat. 
And when the heat got at a certain level, it would seem like the entire forest would be destroyed. And then as a result of the entire forest being destroyed, well, the uh, uh, seed would open, the pine cone would open, and the new seeds would come out, and out of that would come an entirely new forest that would be planted as a result of the seeds coming out. And so that's perturbation. And I believe there was an individual that uh, won an entire Nobel Prize as a result of that. So these are some of the things that we work with in regard to perturbation. And so when that whole piece in regard to that perturbation brings about this whole new forest, this whole new idea. And you can look at things like that and you can look at the aspect of the idea of perturbation um, someone like saying in the book, in the Bible, you have the experience of Job, where Job's entire life uh, was basically destroyed. And when he went through the entire process, he is upset, of course, he is he could be angry, uh, he could be mad. And he could be mad at everything and everybody because they are trying to say that he is the cause of his own destruction. And his three friends are looking at him doing a like a surgical procedure and him with precision. They are trying to isolate and say, well, you did it, you did it, you did it, something you did because of your sins or whatever it may be. But he has refuted all of that. And then he has to deal with God. And God comes and God does not try to defend God's self. But God tries to give um, um, uh, Job a new perspective on everything. And what God is trying to reveal to him is that Job's understanding of life is limited. And he does that by asking Job questions. And he says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Where were you when the morning stars sang together? He says to Job, basically, is that you don't have a total recall of everything that's involved here. In other words, I've got you. You've got to trust in me. I've got you. You've got to trust in me. And I know in my life, I've had places where it is very difficult to trust in God. And so it becomes something that a person has to basically, as it was said about Jacob, when he was going to meet his brother, that you've got to wrestle with God and say, I won't let you go until you bless me. But perturbation out of that comes a new vision. And when Job released and let go and said, you know, I'm going to trust in God. Then that's revealed by the aspect where he said that I have heard about you, but now I see you. I have heard about you, but there's a new level of vision that he has. Now I see you. That's what we're talking about when we talk about this aspect of awareness of vision. It is this new level of understanding that a new level of consciousness that a person arrives at, whatever your past, whatever your mama and daddy may have taught you, Whatever your church may have taught you, whatever your understanding may have taught you, but by gr the grace of God, you've arrived at this point of maturity and you're ready to go to a new level, a new understanding, a new set of consciousness. That, that, that entire thing, that's what we're talking about here. It's awareness of a new vision. And I think it's Margaret Wheatley that said that vision is a feel. And what she's talking about, as I understood it, is an energetic feel. It has power to bring you forward. It has power to pull you into it by the law of attraction, as it's called. And what we're talking about, let me give you another example. This is a very powerful example. Actually, it is the example that a major part of the Bible is based upon. And this person was called Abraham. I've mentioned this before, I think the last time, the, uh, the experience of Abraham that's found in the book of Genesis. And somewhere around uh, the chapters from 30 and going forward in regard to that, particularly uh, chapter 32, there's the experience where Abraham, of course, is going to sacrifice his son. That, 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 that statement to Abraham was that he was going to become the father of nations. He was going to become the father of nations. And so this is a new vision of Abraham. Now, what has he got to do? He has to leave his home. He has to leave, if you want to do it this way, his old set of beliefs. And he's got to travel to a new place. And, and it's a traveling that's going to take a long, long time. He's going to meet new people, new experiences, and everything else. 
And he goes through this entire thing. And I've called this provision a vision. The vision itself has to provide the provisions. In other words, you've got to trust spirit. That spirit is the one that's leading you all the way. And Abraham has times where he really looks at it in some kind of way. It just does not seem to work out. Whatever it is that happens between him and Hagar, that's that's a whole different type of story. But that, that whole piece, we know that Abraham gets to the point that he says basically, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not working out. Uh, just let uh, Ishmael, just, just let it go with him. But God has his own vision for Abraham's life. And that whole piece that when we get to Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, that's based on Abraham's experience. Where the just shall live by faith, that's based on Abraham's experience. Romans is based on Abraham's experience. Habakkuk 11 is based on Abraham's experience. And even when it comes to Luther, when he's writing those, uh, those theses, that's based on Abraham's experience. Is based on Abraham. That entire thing is based on Abraham and what Abraham is doing and what Abraham is going through. It is based on Abraham. When you look at the entire thing, and the vision is that Abraham is asked to count the stars of the sky, and he can't. He can't. If you want to test that, go out one starry night and begin to count. And sometimes it's difficult for you actually to look at the stars and determine where you started and where you end up and the highest number that you got to. And he can't. And God says, that's the number of your seed. That you can't count them all the way. And when that comes to the point where it says that he has sacrificed his son in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. It says it's a figure, it's an allegory that figuratively, figuratively in his mind, he had already gone ahead and sacrificed. But what takes place is that in his mind, he had already gone ahead. Now, I have this thing where I put it together and I looked at it and I said, no, it already happened. No, K-I-A-H, no, it already happened. And there is this other part of that that says K-S-A-A. In other words, you come to the point where it's settled within you. You know it, you state it, you accept it, and you announce it. Now, where do we get that from? Now, I've, I've got a little booklet. That I'd love to send it to you. And there, there are some things in there that, that you know, I'm, I'm just sharing with you. But sometimes you got to read it. And sometimes you got to know it's based on the Bible. It's right there. But there's that experience when you look. And it's the old thing of provision of vision. This is where I actually got this from in regard to this, in particular out of the Bible, provision of vision, because provision of vision is actually the words Jehovah Jireh. That's the Hebrew. If you read the Hebrew, it is right there in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And that was saying to Abraham that he had to get to a particular place, a particular state, a particular level of consciousness. It wasn't that God was not ready to bless Abraham. Now, get this. He could have blessed him in year one. Get that. He could have blessed Abraham in year one. But Abraham was not in the state of mind, not in the state of consciousness where God could do for Abraham what Abraham had been promised. It took Abraham 25 years to get to the point where God could do for him what God wanted to do for him. Some individuals believe that this entire process 
is instantaneous. It is not. That's like you have a baby and the child is an adult instantaneously. Now, if you think that's strange, that's like you have someone that's playing football and the person is an all pro in their position instantaneously. From day one, they are going to the Hall of Fame on day two. It's not possible. It just does not happen. It does not happen in any field that there is. Nowhere. Doesn't happen. But there are individuals that can actually tell another individual that the potential is there. That they see it. I, I just went fishing for Father's Day. We we have about, a, my sons and I, based on my father, my father took my two sons fishing. They, the first time they went fishing with my father, my father loved the fish. I got a story about that as well. Uh, he took them fishing and my youngest son caught a fish about the size of his hand when he was maybe four years old, five years old, something to that effect. About the size of his hand, not the size of my father's hand. But it was planted in his mind that he had a good time with my father fishing. And We've gone fishing now, I guess, for over 20 years or more on Father's Day. And we've had some great times. My, my two sons love to fish. They're better fishermen than I. And they, 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 you know, they love the fish. They caught more fish than I did. And their sons caught more fish than I did. And we went fishing this time as well. They caught more fish than I did. And my fishing is like the fishing of Jesus. I fish for men. I, I fish for men. That's, that's what I do. And we were out there, and there was this other individual who fished for men. And he fished for men when it comes to actually working with them in regard to playing sports. And he saw my younger grandson, or one of my grandsons, actually one of the two older grandsons, and he began to talk about him, talk to him, and talk directly to him about playing football. And he said some things about his height, about his weight, said to him something about growing, still growing. And actually what I did was I went online as a result of what that man said and found out that he actually was saying things that they have in scientific papers. In regard to his growth, my, my grandson's growth, it is actually written in scientific papers. It's online that says exactly what he was saying. I did not know that. Now, it, it was amazing. My point, there was and there is a specific level of growth that one goes through that God already has things planned for you. They are waiting. God, God does not wait to prepare an answer to your prayer. The Bible says God answers your prayer. God answers your treatment before you pray. It's already waiting on you. And God was waiting for Abraham to get figuratively to the top of the mountain. So that he could deliver the blessing to him. No, it already happened. It's already answered. The prayer is already answered. Before you call the text says, God has the answer. God is not waiting on us. We are the ones. That God is waiting on us to get to a level of consciousness. God is waiting on us. We're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. But you can walk with assurance when you know it already happens. So know it already happened. And then know it. State it. Accept it. Announce it. Know it. And we talk about this. But let me go just one step further, just a little bit further, because I actually found an item and 
I'm not sure who wrote it. I'm, I've been searching online. And I, I, I've been searching for this. I can only mention a little bit of it. But it, it's, it, this item says, the mystery applied. It's apparently chapter 3. It then says, the strangest experience of life. If you know somebody who knows where this is coming from, because I haven't been able to find where it's coming from. But it says, it looks like it has a 3. It says, the mystery applied. And says, the strangest experience of life. And it's based on Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 through 15. And then it says 2, it looks like verse 1, 2, and 2, verse 6. And this is written by someone. I'm going to read what it says. It says, a number of years ago, I was holding meetings in a little town in Mullins, South Carolina. One afternoon, I went with the pastor to the post office and found there a letter for me with a local postmark. I wondered who in the world in that town where I had only been two days or three days could be writing a letter to me. Dear Dr. Hill. So apparently this person is named Mr. Hill. Dear Mr. Hill, it read, I have started a letter to you several times, but each time I, was, I have torn it up. Somehow tonight I feel that I must write. I have been everything that a young woman ought not to be. For the past two years, I have tried very hard to live the best I knew how, but I have not been satisfied or happy. I do long for something to live for. I have tried to be a Christian, but I have not succeeded. I have tried to pray, pray, but it just seems like my prayers don't get anywhere. I would like to accept the invitation that you give in the services, but I know I couldn't keep my promise. Will you say something that will help me? And then it was signed without a name. Then he says a very, very miserable person. That was a signature. He said, I will finish this story later on. But just now I want to point out that there that here was a person who, although a church member, had not found what Paul is talking about in Colossians 2, verse 10, where he says, you are complete in him. You are complete in him. In our last study, we learned that God has what God has done for us through the cross of his son. Now we want to see what God also does something to us. So God has done something for us, and then God has done something to us. For when Jesus or when Christ Jesus comes into our hearts, the strangest experience of life becomes ours. This experience is something spoken of in the Bible as regeneration of the new birth. Other times it is referred to as a resurrection or becoming a new creation in Christ. Paul calls it completeness in Christ in this letter of the Colossian Christians. He says in Colossians 2.10, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and powers, Colossians 2.10. What does Paul mean? You are complete in him. He certainly can't mean we are perfect because we know better than that. What then does he mean? Perhaps the illustration of a newborn baby, which I mentioned earlier, will be helpful. Now, a normal little baby boy is not perfect a perfect specimen of manhood at birth. But that newborn baby is potentially perfect specimen of manhood because he is complete. That is, he has in his little body all he needs to become under normal conditions a physically perfect man. Uh, so it is when we are born again. We're not born perfect in the sense of being full grown, but we are born complete in that we have all we need in Christ to one day stand perfect in the presence of God. We have the potential to become perfect, the power to become perfect, and the desire to become perfect. That's what we're talking about in a certain kind of way. However, I would add, as he is saying, that it's very clear, very clear, that the seed has been planted inside of us. I would dare say that the seed was planted in us before the foundation of the earth. That's what God referenced when he spoke to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? 
That's what David referenced when he said to us that his life had been written before he had even been formed in the womb. That's what Jeremiah was reminded of before I called you. I called you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations before you were formed in the womb. All of those things are right there. God knows every one of us. The book of our life has already been written. And so every prayer that we will ever pray or have ever prayed, the answers are waiting on us to pray. And it's with that kind of assurance, that word, there is awareness, there is acceptance, and the next one is assurance. That's the next A. Know it already happened. And then know, state, accept, and announce. Know it. And how do you get to the point that you have that level of assurance? You keep affirming it. You keep affirming it. You keep affirming it. You keep affirming it. It's called affirmations. You keep affirming it. And why are you doing it? Because you are retraining your mind. You are retraining your mind. You are retraining your mind. And your mind will retrain your entire brain. And your brain through your nervous system will retrain your subconscious mind. The, the subconscious will then retrain your entire body. So that you begin to talk better and act better subconsciously you will begin to act totally different and as a result of that your actions will then train your entire environment everything around you and that law of attraction will begin to attract to you and you to it the results that you have called forth that's why the text says let the weak say that I am strong. It will begin, and it will seem indeed like magic to some. Or you will declare that God has delivered you, or God has healed you, or what others have claimed to be and said were miracles. And it is a miracle what God has done. So this is what we're talking about here. And it works in every, in every area, in every system, whatever it may be. Whatever it may be. And the stories have been told over and over again. And it has worked over and over again in many different ways. And it just seems like magic. People were telling the story, whether it was with Aladdin's lamps or whatever it may be, uh, abracadabra. It's all the same thing. It's that magic word that you begin to understand that God has a way that he works it all out for your good. God has a way that God works it all out for your good. But it's that level of assurance that you arrive at. It seems magical. And again, it is magical. Because when you are at the end of your rope, and all of a sudden it seems all of a sudden, it seems, it's like a person said, you seem like an overnight success. Well, you are. It may take 15 years off of Abraham. It may take 25 years. You are overnight. Like you woke up and everything just went your way. This is Dr. Dennis L. Waters. Yes, it is something. It works in every field. Let's look at a and listen to a little bit assurance of the all in the all. Just play, listen to this.
let you go. Just want to let you hear a little bit of that. Take care. God bless you. Dr. Dennis L. Waters. You can email us at info at iwillrestore.org or info at iwillrestore.org. Blessings to you. Take care.